Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, liebe Fischer, ich heiße Sie zur neunten internationalen Erlebniswelt Fliegenfischen 2014 im Namen des Bayerischen Landtags, der Bayerischen Volksvertretung herzlich willkommen. Es ist ja Die Fischer sind eigentlich von ihrer Tätigkeit her die klassischen Naturschützer die alles sofort spüren, wenn irgendwo gegen die Regeln der Natur verstoßen wird. Mich freut ganz besonders auch, dass Sie bei diesem neunten internationalen Erlebniswelt der Fliegenfischer ein Motto gesetzt haben und einen Schwerpunkt gesetzt haben, nämlich den Schutz des Wildlachses. Und deswegen ist es eine besondere Ehre für uns und eine große Freude, den klassischen Schützer des Wildlachses, nämlich Orefik Fusson, bei uns hier einzuladen und ihn hier sprechen zu lassen. Ich darf Sie alle herzlich bitten, auch in Ihrer Tätigkeit, in ihr, äh, jeweils in Ihrem Bereich, alle Bemühungen zu unterstützen, die dazu dienen, die Wildlachsbestände im Nordatlantik zu erhalten, denn das ist ein Erbe der Menschheit, dass, wenn es verloren geht, große negative Auswirkungen auf uns alle haben kann. In diesem Sinne wünsche ich der neunten internationalen Erlebniswelt Fliegenfischen einen vollen Erfolg, viele Teilnehmer, zufriedene Teilnehmer und alles Gute. Dankeschön. Dignitaries, Organizers, Ladies and Gentlemen, I can't say how much grateful I am for the opportunity to come to this wonderful part of the world and talk about my favorite subject, the wild salmon. Uh, I, I was amazed to learn about this event. My friends from Iceland, some of them are here today, they've been telling me about this event and encouraged me to come because they say this is the heart of the European center for what, where things are taking place in Europe. Uh, the reason I started the North Atlantic Summer Fund is because I come from a herring family. So fish, fish, fish is all we thought about. And uh, I'm a passionate fisherman. That is why I decided to, to act back in 1989 when we started this uh, North Atlantic Summer Fund. And the mission was very simple, to help restore salmon uh, uh, throughout its range, the North Atlantic salmon, and, uh, and that is why we decided, we decided the key issue was that all the salmon from whatever country, from whatever region or river, needed to have a free ride in the ocean throughout the marine environment to migrate and feed, where they do so for one, two, three, four years, even more, and allow them free passage back to their home native river. I thought this would only take about two years. I thought everybody would see it my way. Oh no. So instead of giving up, I decided to enhance the mission to also embrace the, the life cycle of the salmon in river. And I very quickly realized that most of the governments uh, authorities around the world, they were not thinking about the full life cycle of the salmon, they were only thinking about their own country's interest. And I'm not excluding any country in that, uh, in that respect. Uh, it's been almost 25 years since we started. Uh, is the translator, I mean, am I speaking too much? Or? No, it's fine. It's just, just you could slow down a little bit. You could uh, okay. just a okay. little. I know Thank you're you. excited and happy to be here. Okay, okay. This was 25 years ago, and we now <laughs> have, have operations one way or another in 14 countries. I've had the uh, uh, success of working with many good people in this country, and, uh, and, uh, and some of them are here today. I'm very, very grateful, and, but of course, we have to do much more, and we have to embrace this is a big mission. How do we create a vision for salmon restoration in Europe? Just in case. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I need that. Yeah, thank you.
I do not claim to have the full answer, but I think as some of the some of the philosophy, some of the methodology we have adopted and helped develop uh, in salmon restoration can be used to uh, to help uh, restore salmon stocks in Europe. And, and we have to do that. I mean, already your government, your regions are doing a great job cleaning up the rivers and, and improving habitat, and we the private sector, we have to coordinate and ourselves and work with everybody uh, so that we can achieve this goal. Of course, many projects have failed and or are too slow to, to accommodate what's happening in the environment. Uh, we have to develop, I think we have to deliver develop what I call a new intellectual interest, so that it's not as, as uh, Borke said a few minutes ago, we have to, it's not enough to talk the talk, we have to walk the walk. And, uh, and uh, encourage changes, new approaches, and new applications of techniques in the restoration of the salmon. I just want to show you this. This is a map of the North Atlantic salmon world through the, the entire range from, from the US, from the state of Maine, in, on the west coast, on the east coast of, of America, and all the way uh, south to Spain, north to Greenland, and east to, to the Barents Sea and even the White Sea. Usually, this is the temperature in the water that is between 4 and 8 degrees. And this is where the salmon uh, like to accumulate. Uh, when they grow very, very big, like sort of five kilos or 10 kilos, they venture even further north because they claim there are better restaurants up there. <laughs> of course, what are the problems? We know there are many natural climatic uh, fluctuations, but that should be no excuse for not doing our job. Believe me, Overfishing and poor regulation are very, very dominant throughout this industry. Fishing all over the world is on the decline. There are less and less fish. And believe me, there is, the main reason is that we are killing too many fish. We are not leaving enough broodstock in the ocean or in the rivers. And that should be our priority always. Of course, there are damaged and reduced habitat, there are contaminated waters, there are negative effects on fish farming and agriculture runoffs and many, many other problems. But the important thing is to select and make simple things out of all the practical actions we can take because, because uh, uh, common sense and practical actions is what you and I can do immediately tomorrow. Uh, some of these things we have been lucky to adopt in my home country in Iceland. Uh, and I'm comparing here the EU countries for Atlantic salmon in the last 10 or 12 years to Iceland. You can see uh, the, on, the, on the EU countries on the left hand side, the, uh, this is principally salmon catches in Ireland, in Scotland and in, in England. The, 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 the numbers in Europe, the numbers in Germany, France, and Spain are very, very uh, tiny. One thing you should bear in mind, and uh, the Vice President asked me about the negotiation a few minutes ago between Iceland and EU. It's because we are afraid in Iceland to, we were told we had to adopt the EU management structure of, 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 of fisheries. We live in Iceland because there's fish, 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 always. There's, there, that is our principal source of income. That is what we think about when we wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning at the last thing we hear on the radio at 12 o'clock at night. And remember, very important, the, this is a chart showing the jurisdiction of the salmon and where the biomass is created. More than 90% of European salmon, 90% of the biomass is created outside your jurisdiction. 
the jurisdiction, the, the, the feeding grounds are mostly around Faroe Islands, around Greenland, and around Iceland. So, so we have to cooperate. There's no other way. Okay, we talked about the problems very briefly. Now, where are the solutions? First, our strategy must be to include the whole life cycle of the salmon. People say people own fishing rights upriver, middle river, downriver, in the estuaries, in coastal waters, on the open seas, on the high seas very far up north. I know Greenlanders who last year went underneath the ice with their, with their uh, uh, nets and they caught a number of big salmon underneath the ice where they usually uh, catch the, the so-called black halibut. Just to show you that uh, climate change or global warming, whatever you want to call it, is moving a lot of life further to the north. Cod is moving north, uh, uh, monkfish is moving north. There's, we have a big debate at the moment with the EU as you know, the mackerel. The mackerel that used to f uh, migrate and feed from the west coast of Africa north to the North Sea is now starts from the North Sea and goes beyond Scotland, beyond Faroe Islands, beyond Iceland, even to Greenland. Of course, it, this is, it has happened in less than 20 years. Of course, there's going to be a dispute. How do we share? How do we share the resource? And the scientists are giving us uh, talks on how, where the biomass is created. And we say it's being created in Iceland because that's where they, 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 they get fat during the summer, July, August. And, and Norway say instead, no, 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 there are only a few weeks in Iceland, so they usually get much less. There is no formula for this. That is why we have this dispute and, this, and, and, and discussion. Anyway, our, I think our strategy must be to have develop new action plans to support effective initiative policies and with new leaders, with new people. I mean, the young people, I see a lot of young people in the audience today, they must help us create action plans so the right elements be implemented so we have a lot of action groups, I think, throughout Europe to do this, uh, not just in upriver, but also downriver and middle river. And I think we should also adopt more of the method, methodology that have always, always all, already proven very successful. And of course, we must, there, there is no one government, there is no one region that can do it. We all have to pull in the same direction. We have to work together so that we will get some success. Uh, that is to work together between the private and the public sector, and hopefully these new action groups, the young people, will find and be able to uh, 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 define new plans for this. I have a, we have a, at NESF, we have a very simple philosophy. That is the philosophy of abundance. If you talk to scientists, they, they have a philosophy of the problems, always trying to break up the problems to my, smaller and smaller biological uh, microgroups. If you concentrate on that, you will be studying that problem forever. I, I'm not saying this to, to diminish the, the scientists. We need them. But we need, we need eff just like in business or in banking or investment, we need effective businessmen, effective people who can design policies and actions that are workable. And I call upon you here in Germany. I mean, you are the best technicians in the world. And, and we always say in Iceland, when Germany is playing, don't watch it because Germany is going to win anyway, you see. Uh, so what we do, that is why we decided to address the NESF philosophy is to work with people. To, we never force anything. We never take anything by force. We address the biology by also addressing the uh, economics, the income of the people, and the socioeconomics. That is why it is important that when we ask a netsman in Greenland, Longline and the Faroe Islands, to give up his historic right, 
that we find some other sustainable jobs for him so that he can change over and he will also be better off. He will be better off and the environment will be better off. Now, the issues to address is the so-called mixed stock fishery in the ocean. It's called mixed stock because the nests in the ocean, they are not just taking someone from one river, they take someone from two or three or more rivers. Net cannot decide only to take a salmon from a very healthy river. They would take everything. That is why back in Oslo, at the NASCO meeting in 1994, it was the finally decided and approved that mixed stock fishery sh should never be allowed on scientific grounds, on, on administrative grounds. Migrated routes should be protected, fish farms should be closed, either in closed containment or land-based. That is what we promote. In-river habitat must be uh, protected, clean waters where you have done a wonderful job in Europe, and, and we have to tear, uh, tear down some of the dams so that allow the salmon to go to all their old uh, uh, spawning grounds. Build a broodstock with modern uh, fishing regulation, cuts and release, and of course, using when the biological level of the, so of the stocks are so low that natural biodiversity cannot survive, there is nothing else you can do but to employ stocking. First of all, we always try to improve the, uh, uh, help the rivers by using, the, uh, letting the river do it herself. When it's too low, we have to revert to uh, uh, stocking. I want to talk to you about that in a minute. I want to go through these points. <laughs> this is where we have employed commercial agreements uh, using the, uh, the North Atlantic Salmon Fund. Over the last 20, 25 years, I think I raised about 60, 70 million dollars. This is what, 50 million euros, actually uh, uh, to pay these, the fishermen not to fish, or more importantly, we pay into a fund. Like in Greenland, we have a fund where we control together with the fishermen organization and we help the fishermen divert into something else and then we help him get uh, grants from this fund to go into snow crabbing, go into lumpfish, shrimps or whatever. I even, some in, in August, I, I pay them for transporting meat, renting meat from the hunting grounds to slaughterhouses which are EU approved. We will try, we will try anything. One lady in Iceland who used to fish for salmon is now, uh, uh, she wanted to open a cheese shop. She was a, a, a milk farmer too. So now she has a thriving cheese shop. We do, they must, if they, if they give away their natural sustainable rights, they must be able to use the compensation to buy something else that is sustainable. We have, uh, by the way, uh, after a few years, I was told that there was still netting in Iceland. So my friends were very angry with me. Why are you spending money all over the world and not in Iceland? So in 1996 and 7, we negotiated and we bought out the netting rights in the whole of Iceland. And we, 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 we struck it out of the registry, of the, uh, of the uh, property registry. So someone now from any nation with Icelandic 200 mile uh, fisheries jurisdiction any summer from Germany, France, and Spain, or America can come, and forever and ever and ever, they will never ever be allowed to be caught in Iceland. We have, uh, since 90, April 1991, we have had an agreement with the Faroe Islands. They come to me in Iceland every, every year to get their annual uh, compensation. Last month they came, I gave them a check for 210,000 euros. That's the uh, fee. And believe me, it sounds much, but it's nothing compared to the benefit we get. Uh, in Greenland, we usually have three, four or five years uh, agreements. It's not in perpetuity like in, we try always perpetuity, but that's not always possible, especially on the high seas. 
So they had a five-year agreement. But three years ago, they came and said, Ori, why is it that all the salmon we save in Greenland and the Faroe Islands, we've sold millions, millions of salmon in the Faroe Islands, and are returning, have returned to Scotland. Out of the one million salmon to Scotland, 990,000 were caught in the coastal nets of Scotland. Scotland is still cutting. And why are you using one science for Greenland and another science for Ireland? This is why we, we need a new international treaty for the salmon. The so-called NASCO Treaty only gives the, gives the, the uh, puts the burden of Greenland and the Faroe Islands to have a quota. There's no quota in Scotland, no quota in Canada, no quota in Ireland, no quota in Norway. And these, why should we f f save all these fish and before they come to the spawning grounds? They are caught, they are killed. And they are right. And they have been issuing this warning at the NASCO meeting for the last five years. And last year, Greenland said, OK, we will show you what we mean. So they issued a 35 metric tons quota, commercial quota, in Greenland uh, last year. I told the American government, I went there in, in January, I said, we have to do something drastic. OK, they agreed to come with me to Greenland. This is three weeks ago, and we talked to them. We pleaded them. Greenland and the USA is so important. There are less than 1,000 salmon in America, in the USA River less than 1,000. They all feed along the west coast of Greenland. I told the Americans, look, if you do, don't do something very, very big, you're going to be in trouble because your salmon is now on the endangered species list. And when you're on the endangered species list in America, if the agencies don't do everything in their power, they are simply put into jail. They have to do it. They realized, so they came with me to Greenland two weeks ago, we pleaded and pleaded, and we really have some hopes that Greenland will do something, uh, come back to our agreement this year. The other problem I told you about, sorry, I was, I was going to show you a little more about this. Greenland we do, Faroe Islands do, we Iceland, we, uh, we, we rent, release out the rights for the salmon in the Pyrenees Atlantic region. In, in, in on the French side. You may not believe it, but on the Spanish side there, a man called Generalismo Franco, he put a law on that side to banning all netting. I met her, his daughter the other day and, and, and reminded her, her, after all, her father did something very, very good. Uh, we have also bought out the, uh, most of the netting in Wales. In the, we are slowly coming along this coast of, of England, buying out into the coastal nets in the river, uh, in the river Avon and the river, river X last year. And at the moment, we have, are talking to some of the Scot Scottish people who are, uh, of course, still exercising. For the first time in many, many, 20, 30 years, Coastal netting in Scotland increased rather than decreased. This is terrible. So we have launched a very heavy campaign against Mr. Salmon, and, 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 uh, and because he very cleverly set up a review group for Salmon to report in December after the referendum. I think this was, a, a, as a politician, I probably would have done the same, uh, and, uh, but we have really accused him for doing this, you see. In Ireland, the, uh, they were, I made 92 visits to Ireland from the year of 1991 to 1997. In the end, they finally gave in. For 16 years, they said, Ori, it, you don't understand the Irish character. It cannot be done in Ireland. In 1997, they did exactly what I told them to do back in 1991, exactly the same. Anyway, uh, and of course the Northeast Driftness, we did a partnership deal with Tony Blair back in 2003, and he gave us 1.3 million pounds. I raised 2.6 million pounds, and we bought most of the Driftness in the North Sea. 
which of course should also benefit someone coming into Europe. We still have a problem in Europe, that's in the Vattenzone area. We've been trying, bombarding the Dutch government to stop the netting there of someone. There still allows no netting there. And that is something we have to take care of before we can be very effective in, 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 in the European context. I'll just briefly uh, show you this photograph. This is, uh, this is the problem between wild salmon and, 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 and farmed salmon. We have nothing against farmed salmon, but it mustn't touch the sea. In the sea, salmon in cages cannot be controlled. It's been tried. They generate a lot of pollution. They generate, uh, they, they use medicine, a disease. They, uh, they have, uh, uh, they escape, they go into the rivers, they, and they generate sea lice. Uh, in the temperature, if it, like in the Faroe Islands, even in Iceland, if the temperature uh, is sort of above four or five degrees, uh, there's a huge growth of sea lice. And the biggest problem in Norway over the years, over the last 20 years, in the fish farming industry has been the sea lice. The long-term problem, of course, is the genetic, genetic pollution. When the salmon, farmed salmon go into the rivers and mix with, with wild salmon, and the offspring and, and, the, uh, and the morning after and the morning after creates long-term problems and could ruin, this, ruin this in, uh, the, the stocks. We are also engaged in, uh, in, uh, in, in increasing the habitat for salmon, and that means pulling down some dams that block access of salmon up to the upper reaches where the best spawning grounds are. I do a lot of work for the uh, advisory work for the French government. They listen very carefully. Uh, they even give me a little bit of money every year for 20 years. And they asked me to take a look at the rivers in, in Normandy. And we did a lengthy report, and I have a copy for anybody who wants to see. And this is the uh, dam on the Cellon. And there's, there are two dams there, built in 1915 and 1935. And I told them, look, guys, you have to pull this down. There's no other way. To my surprise, they said, yes, we'll pull it down. So there are a lot of dams, probably, that could be pulled down. We are engaged with the Atlantic Summer Federation in uh, North America. And there, we have started buying our dams on the Penobscot River in there. And we started by uh, pulling that down last year. But the salmon, of course, need the best habitat there is. Building up brood stocks in rivers. My message to you here now, to the, all the anglers, please do not kill one more salmon in Europe. I mean, their stocks are so low, you need them all. You need them all for brood stock in the future. I just want to show you uh, my model river, the Sellau, and my partner Gisli is with me today, has been talking about the fishing in Iceland. This is what we did. We, uh, we, we built a fish ladder back in 1969, and we, built, we started to uh, cut and release uh, in around 1992. And so slowly, the salmon stock, the annual cuts there, have come from 100 salmon to 300 salmon to 500 to 1,000, 2,000, and up to 2,700 salmon. This is principally because of increased habitat and because of cr and cuts and release, because of extra spawning, uh, was accommodated by the habitat and could increase the cut and release is a very, very, very successful tool. And I, and, and I was in last year, I was, I was speaking in Spain, in Galicia, and I told them, there was a meeting like this, and they, they were, we were publishing a new book, and I told them, look, you, you have to start cut and release. 300 years ago, here on the northern part of Spain, you caught six, 650,000 salmon. Even in the 1920s in the northern part of Spain, you caught 20,000 salmon. Now it's less than 1,000 salmon. And you still, want, you still think you can cut, kill them? Nobody in the audience understood me. I'm sad to say. Yeah. Anyway, but this is to show you that cuts and leaves can do. One more thing, the last thing I want to say here, is that the, 
when the stocks are so low that you have to use stocking. Yeah. You have to use the stock from the original river and you have to do it carefully. And we believe in this new technology developed by Peter Gray on the River Tyne in England. The River Tyne was a prolific river, you know, for many hundreds of years. In the 1920s, it was, it was so badly affected by pollution and everything that it was down to zero. Uh, Peter Gray took it over uh, about 30 years ago. He developed this technology of, uh, of, of, of uh, raising par using brutes. Uh, he used brutes from anywhere, which of course is we would never allow today. But he did that. He took uh, uh, grills from the River Connon and uh, 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 River. Uh, many different rivers in Scotland. Anyway, River Tyne is now using this methodology is one of the best, uh, best uh, it, it is the best, most salmon producing river in England. And we are now uh, working with the American government to doing exactly the same in, in, in the state of Maine. It's a river, I told them, give me the worst river in Maine. And we're doing it there. It's called East Machayas and it's East of Bangor and we hope to do the same there. I know that there are people in this room, like uh, in the, in the Laxferein and, and others, also developing a very fine technology in, in several parts of, 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 of Germany, and of course that is what we have to, have to do. Uh, I think I've been through all the main things I want to say, but of course I will be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you again, but remember we have to, we have to get this right. We have to get the salmon into all the rivers in Iceland, that includes Switzerland, up through to the Schaffhausen Falls. Okay, thank you again. Thank you.